Folks, welcome inside the Paris Sea Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, Comedy on Power Talk. Thank you so much for making us part of your day today, wherever you are in this great land, all over the world, streaming live on Power Talk. And what a high honor it is to bring in a cat, younger generation cat, hungry um uh dedicated to authenticity on the bandstand um not easy to conform i think he'd probably um get a day job or he does have a day job before he would actually conform to being something in the music industry that he wasn't but you know that's one of the issues going on in society today is taking younger cats who may or may not have talent and then con twisting and contorting them into some sort of pop musical star uh, based on their looks, based on their uh, Twitter feed. Uh, but again, I mean, the aesthetic that I look for with cats is always, are you your authentic self? Have you found your individual voice? And do, when you get on the bandstand, no matter what kind of music you're playing, is it a matter of life and death? Seamus Turner, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake. How's it going? Going well, man. How are you doing? Doing all right. Just uh, kind of chilling. This is a nice, warm morning in Southern California. You know. It's, uh, yeah. Let, 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 let's let's let's. It's all relative, man. It's already 101 here. You know, in Tucson. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yo, um, can you just be as honest? Talk to your brothers and sisters out there um, about yeah. emotionally how you feel about. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're keeping your equilibrium, uh, riding the crest of a wave or plucking the banjo, but what does it feel like to have this uh, extended period of time not being able to make love with your with your peers on the bandstand? Uh, well, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a tough thing, um, I think, for everybody. Um, I mean, there's definitely um, a void there. You know, uh, because being able to play live music is definitely the um, the kind of it's, it's what we like to do best. Um, and uh, you know, it's mostly mostly the biggest thing I miss is just the rep, uh, the reciprocal effect of um, you know playing for people. And um, there, there's that feeling that you get whenever somebody's listening uh, to your music, and um, that's kind of what helps uh you know feed or, or it's kind of what helps um you know you know get that feeling across uh to, to do you, you know, i mean do, do you like i mean yeah, you, yeah you're talking about like the magic of music you know the ability to not only raise the collective consciousness of the unit but when that extends out to the audience comes back to the band and then that's you know kind of a magical thing but um I mean, but prior to this, if um, if music was taken away from you, would your soul have died? And I guess the, the better question is like now, how are you sustaining your, how are you feeding your soul in these times? I mean, I realized that, you know, I remember Steve Cropper told me, he's just like, a lot of younger cats, they music was an end all be all everything for them and they didn't really actually step back and enjoy life they didn't have a full life yeah. and this is coming from i mean stacks records i mean the guy was like you know on, and i mean he maybe he you know he just he was on so many records and but yet he was talking about the full perspective and view of life and 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 so you know i know how are you feeding yourself spiritually in this time because i i mean i know you're, I know I'm friends, I'm close with a lot of your compadres, and and I just yeah. sort of know that that's what fed them. I mean, the, the music chose them. So how, what, are you meditating? Are you, I mean, what are you doing, diff what are you doing now to fill that, to fill that gap? Well, um, I mean, I'm still playing, um, definitely still playing uh, a lot of music, and we're still jamming together. Um, but, uh, to kind of, I guess, I mean, it's, I've been trying to get out of town a little bit and, you know, um, you know, been doing just like some, some surfing 
Um, and that's, that's helped kind of keep my, keep my head, uh, straight on my shoulders, you know? Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I dig, I dig. it's been, yeah, but I mean, as far as like, you know, meditating or anything, I haven't really, um, I haven't really done any of that. Well, no, cause um, you know, let me be clear. I, I, I didn't mean like, that's the problem with Western dogma is like, you know, you have this, this belief that, you know, you need to be in some sort of sedentary position and in stillness to do meditation. I mean, to me, musicians on the bandstand, that's yoga. Uh, surfing yeah. is yoga. So, I mean, you're not doing traditional, what dogmatically they talk about in the West is meditation. But I'm just saying, right. what are you doing to calm your mind? And that's what, you're, what you just laid out there. When you say you guys yeah. are jamming, uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, it is so rough right now. Um, even looking, like you look at, Dis if you look at Disney World, I think it was Disney World that opened, right? Not Yeah, Disney World opened, and it yeah. opened yesterday. And, you know, if you just put that as a template for live music, it's, you know, it's a little bit humbling in terms of, um, you know, just what to expect to get, you know, if and when we get back to live music, spiritual yeah. communal live music. I mean, it's, it's temperature checks at the door. It's, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot less people in a, in a place that could hold more people. Um, it's a lot of social distancing. It's a lot of staying with your gr cr group. It's no dancing for me. This is unacceptable. It's absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah. but, 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 for, but, you know, but, but putting that away, I mean, talk about when you say jamming, are, are you and clay like staying six feet apart and like, jam I mean, what does that look like it, it, right now? Well, uh, we were, we were up with, um, we're, we're up in, uh, kind of like the La Cunada area because, uh, Cameron had a little, our, our bass player had a place up there. Um, and we were jamming there, um, like a few times a week, um, and we we've been pretty careful about who's been going out and seeing. We haven't really we've we've been kind of kept to ourselves uh, for the most part. And um, it's been uh, yeah, it's been it's been really tough on everyone, you know. Um, it's because I mean, playing music is also just like such a an amazing you know social experience where you're just. You know, hang out with all your friends. Oh man, dude, it's fucking great, man. I mean, it's 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 what I'm saying, man. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, I think it's going to be forever changed. It's going to be, I mean, it's going to be kind of like how like the the airlines were like after 9/11. I mean, before you're able to like bring like a box cutter or something like onto an airplane, um, but now it's going to be. I, I think that large, I think what we really need is it's like a vaccine so that everybody feels secure that they're, they're, they're in a safe kind of environment, you know? Um, you know, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. Number one, it's like there are – this virus took down one of my spirit brothers in Tucson who was a tour de force and completely healthy, 52. Yeah. Uh, my older daughter's yeah. best friend. And this thing is like nothing we've ever seen. There are – the idea of waiting – I, I, I'm with you. I, I, I also know that half the country – you know, you live in California, which is a relatively progressive place. Um, yeah. More than half the country wouldn't even... The, the anti-vax movement is insane. So it's like you have to realize half the population wouldn't even take it to begin with. But I'm with you in terms of even traveling right now. I, I had a couple of friends uh, just go up to Flagstaff uh, two weekends ago and... Um, yeah, the guy came back and I reached out. I said, "Yo, you want to catch a hang?" And he's like, um, "You know, I'm sick." <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, it is it is just regionally. There's regional funk everywhere, so I, I just think it's oh, totally. you know, it's really and the arrows are falling closer. You know, it's, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I know, I know multiple people that have had it, and it's uh, yeah, it's a total total bummer. You know, and I really hope that uh, things get better. You know, it's, it's, uh, it really has you know, thrown everything, or it's turned everything on its head, you know. Let me ask you a question more specifically about Pacific Range, is that um, when I look at, um, you know, younger bands that I dig, I mean, I know that nobody was getting rich, but I think the, the criminal aspect of this invisible virus is that, um, you know, the economy was doing really well for 
you know, even for working bands. I mean, there was there were touring circuits and there were opportunities. It seemed like there was a lot of momentum heading in the authentic, creative, live music experience. Is that a fair statement? That's also one reason it's sort of been like a shock thing. It wasn't like, I mean, I'm not saying the pay was great, but what I'm saying is that you guys were playing a lot and probably touring a lot. Yeah, yeah, we were, um, yeah, I think that live music, I think that that's something that um, will will never really go away um, just because I think uh, everybody's, everybody needs to go out. It's, it's like therapy for people too, you know, healing. It's um, healing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, if you're, that, that's what it was for me. That was just like, that. it's like an outlet for me to go and, um, and, and, and basically go get out and see some, you know, music and dance and, um, you know, kind of, kind of get it all out of your system, you know? Oh, and, that, that's uh, what I'm saying. I mean, how worried are you about, um, you know, just like, I know so many beautiful cats. They're all from that, like, bad. I mean, I've been, it, it just, it's really an honor to connect with you because, I mean, all these guys that I love, Farmer Dave and, you know, all these, yeah. uh, you know, Dan Horn and, you know, freaking legendary cats and the list goes on and on. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> these guys, I mean, they're not like, like, well, like, Farmer, Farmer's pretty loquacious, but like, Horn, like, I've been, Horn and I have, have done some interviews and, I mean, that dude is like the rock of Gibraltar. He like, I, I know he's okay, and I always keep checking in on him, but most people yeah. most people get stuff out of their system on the bandstand. They're not like, that's like, they're not going to shrinks. You know, I am worried about people who are either, and I'm not talking about horns specifically, but I'm saying people that either feel shame or guilt for feeling really dark and that they should look for help. It's okay to to reach out for help at this time, you know? Yeah. I think that that's, that's an important, you know, I think that's really important. The mental health of, of musicians and, you know, you, you want everybody to be well mentally too, because it, it is a big outlet for, for musicians to get up there and play. And a lot of people, you know, they, they don't, um, you know, if you're a musician, you know, and that's all that you have there, you don't really have any other way of, Right, just getting it out. Right, you know? right, dude. Uh, yeah, the music shows. Do you remember the? Do you remember like? Because I mean, there are a lot of po- like, like I said. I mean, it's really nice to find authentic creatives in today's world because that's kind of all it was back in the you know fifty years ago, sixty seventy years ago. Is you had to reach a certain bar to get stuff recorded. Um, it had to be really pretty high quality music. There was a lot of concept albums. Obviously, there was full humanity in the studio. None of this electronic drum crap or anything like that. And um, and I wonder if you remember when you recognized that this was the only thing that you knew, not necessarily knew how to do, but the only thing that made sense for you to do, like the music chose you. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it, it did, you know, and um it was uh yeah back back when i was like in college um i met i met clay uh he was in the same dorms as i was and i was going to school to become uh, a nurse and um eventually we started jamming and um then i switched my major to being a music major after after jamming a a lot with um you know my my dorm mates and, and clay um and uh and then Clay, um, we 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 went through a couple different incarnations of of the band, and um, he eventually moved back down to L.A. I stayed up there for like another year, and um, that's that's kind of how uh, it came to be. Um, so there it really wasn't it really wasn't like a choice for me. I felt like you know it was something that I thought would be a great way to get. Uh, get it out for myself and also um if you can make other people you know happy you know playing music i mean heck you know i might keep that person from you know going and doing something catastrophic you know absolutely yeah uh, absolutely you know. dude i mean this is a it's i mean it's it's a magical um it's a magical thing i you know uh, seamus we have a, a game on this program called 
name that voice. I'm going to put this voice in for you right now. Take a listen to the content, and we'll come back. Well, love to me is what makes everything go around. I think that love created the universe. I think that if you if you say you do not believe in God, you're an atheist or whatever. You know, I respect that. Uh, I think we all need to respect uh, how how each other feels about things in life. Um, but for you to say that you don't believe in God, and if you have a little daughter or a little son, and you look in their eyes, you can't tell me that you don't believe in love. Mm-hmm. And to me, God is love. So I don't think I need to go any further with that as far as that's concerned. And mm-hmm. I, also, I also believe that, uh, that, and especially at this time in, in the world, what's going on out there in the world, it's just insane. And we need to hold on to love. We need to hold on to what love is. We need to realize that there's a heavy struggle going on in the world, and and I don't think any of us really understand. We don't understand it like we we should. But I know one thing for sure: that this world needs love. It always did. Jackie DeShannon said it. Seamus, you want to take a guess at who that is? Oh man! Uh... I mean, you're not going to. There's no way. There's a couple more I got that you might get, but. Uh... That was yeah. um, that was from my my first interview with a dear friend from August 2014. That was uh, Jim Keltner, the drummer. All right, nice, yeah. And I wanted you to talk about in the dorms at Chico State when you mm-hmm. walked when you met these cats. Is is that the first time, in the sense that musically, you felt the connection of love? Uh. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, you know, because uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've heard I've heard that said before um, that you know God like God is love and and you know looking you know I've heard that before. Yeah, well, you um, know, I mean, it's also the, the idea is that we all. It's the idea that I mean, he made the allusion to to a little you know having kids, uh, young kids, and looking in their eyes and seeing this unconditional you know when they need some kind of of reinforcement and and you give it to them even non-verbally and you can see in their eyes the security of love but there's also the idea that we all have god inside of us and in some cases yeah. it would be clear that you know someone like yourself was a conduit for the music coming through you from the heavens and i kind of wanted you to talk about that those early days at chico state when you guys were starting to cook the groove and how there was no, mm-hmm. you know, how basically my my gut feeling, even though I wasn't anywhere near there, is that um, you were able to give an honest interpretation of the music. You didn't have to, you know, pretend you were somebody else. You could be yourself. Right. And I just wanted you to talk about how that came together because I went to Boston University. It was like a very sterile dorm experience. But Chico State, I mean, there were probably like couches and – really mellow air <laughs> like i'm just curious about like the whole vibe because that that plays a role in in feeling comfortable with you know when you're cooking the groove yeah yeah well we were uh we were in the dorms um and uh it was it was kind of an unspoken thing you know whenever i mean you, you just got together and then you started playing and there there's just like that connection you know and you didn't have to really like talk about like what you were playing or anything it was almost just like yeah, just like understood, you know, and um, that's 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 the beauty of like the the musical language, you know, um, especially if you're uh, just kind of playing by ear, um, and you're able to pick up on on the vibe that the other person is kind of getting across to you, and um, it it when it when it's completely natural, um, I really feel like you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to explain yourself or anything like that through uh, what you're playing, or you know, um, it's it's a it's a super unspoken uh, feeling, uh, and it's it's a it's a feeling of connectedness and and yeah, feeling that that love through your music and um, 
you know, when it sounds, uh, when it sounds good and you don't have to like, you know, hash out like, you know, like all the details. Right. Right. It doesn't have to be so intellectualized. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's more of just like a feeling, you know, and, um, it's, it's not really like spoken of. I mean, after the jam, maybe you're like, man, that was, that was a lot of fun, you know, there's stuff that's there, you know, um, but when it's just happening, it's, it's like the ultimate, like, feeling of just being, you know, like, you're living in the moment, you're listening, and, and you're listening, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing, you're damn right, um, is, is just being able to listen, and, um, you know, kind of at, contribute to the conversation, you know, uh, musically, and it's, uh, I don't know. It's like it's like Weather Report, right? They're they're like a solo list band. I mean, granted the, you know, maybe the designated parts or whatever. But I think that they were trying to, you know, go after like a, a more. It was like a conversation. Absolutely, know? dude. Um, I mean, people, dude, you're people, nailing it, dude. I, it, it, it's it is. But I mean, does that converse? Is it? It's sort of a multi-part question. But obviously, you were in nursing and then veered into music uh education or becoming a, mu- a mu- uh, music degree um did you think that there was a an emphasis enough of an emphasis placed on ear training as opposed to reading because a lot of cats today there's a crisis in in, in a lot of music not for seekers not for you know creatives per se but um uh, cats that wind up uh, most cats today are learning to read music before they can hear music and as a result uh-huh. their ears are locked and you know you right. go back to someone like Charlie Parker he was listening to every station oh, yeah. on the radio it didn't matter what the music was and he was learning to play every song and every key so his ears were huge and most of the cats yeah. that I've interviewed over the last 10 years they definitely got their reading chops up but they started by learning by ear and I, and and that's what I wanted to ask you about is, is, is how you learn to, to play by ear and how that's helped your ears grow. Yeah. Well, um, you know, growing up, uh, there was always like a piano, uh, sitting around, um, like my parents, uh, picked up like this old, uh, like stand up piano that was always just like kind of in like the, the entry, um, of our house. And, um, I would go up to it and I was also taking fiddle lessons at the time and learning how to read music doing that. Wow. Uh, but it was mostly like bluegrass. It wasn't like classical. My parents wanted to keep it fun. Um, you know, the, I feel like classical can be like super rigid sometimes and, you know, um, but a lot of that, you know, uh, playing like, like, well, I would walk up to like the piano and, you know, be able to play something that was maybe like you know taught to me on that on on and then um but uh yeah i mean growing up uh, my parents they they had me start playing like bluegrass music and that's kind of um and and playing like the, the fiddle that really helps your ear because you don't there are no frets on it you know <laughs> um, yeah. dude i love this stuff i mean hold on i mean i mean i remember I got to send you some of these interviews because, I mean, I've interviewed, you know, Richard Green and, and, you know, I didn't get to Vassar. But, I mean, those these guys, were, I mean, to me, it's more than the ear. But did you feel like you developed really good inner time uh, playing the fiddle? Because, I mean, most bluegrass settings did not have a drummer, you know, so you really – had to keep your own internal time. Do you feel like you developed really strong time at that point too? I think I think so. Uh, there, there was at one point where it just kind of clicked where it was like, oh, this is like what the song is supposed to sound like. And I think you had to kind of hear the song before, you know, actually uh, sitting down and like learning the piece of music, you know. And eventually, and eventually it just kind of like clicked as to like what the rhythm should be. You know, um, we would play to like a metronome every once in a while, but it was always with another person. Um, so he would put like the piece of music up and then, uh, his name was Frank Javorsek. He's like this old, old time bluegrass guy he was, he was, uh, at the Blue Ridge Pick and Parlors. Wow, dude, badass. 
and it was uh, um, and he uh, he would always we would always play uh, together. You know, he would play the song, and then um, and then I would accompany him and and just kind of tag along and play what he was playing. Um, and uh, if he had something to say, of course, he would correct me and everything. But he, um, you know, yeah, he really helped you know, develop my ear, and eventually he would just, like, turn the piece of music over and be like, all right, we're doing it from memory, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna look at this anymore, um, we're just gonna play it together, and, uh, I think that that's, that's super important, you know, because, um, I mean, having, like, being able to play something as, like, a duo or, um, it is, it is kind of like teaching, teaching you how to jam with people, um, you know, uh, and, and listen. Oh, yeah, it's uh, great, man. You got the old school method. I mean that, and then also what did you, when you, can you give an example of a song like you were talking about where all of a sudden you heard it and then it, the, the sort of something clicked where it was like, wow, that's the way the song's supposed to sound like. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be, it was really, um, it, there's like, uh, I mean, the clouds real is also is one of those kind of standard tunes. Yeah. Um, but I mean, anything even before that, I mean, I know that I said that we didn't really go over a lot of classical stuff, but like Ode to Joy, for example, you know, mm-hmm. something as simple as, that. Um, you know, uh, that, that, you know, a song like that could really help, you know, help it click for somebody, um, you know, um, it's, uh, but it really was like, kind of like, whoa, okay, like, this is, this is what it's supposed to be rhythm- rhythmically, and, um, and it, it, it wasn't, um, it, it, I just remember like just kind of going through the motions and then after, uh, and then eventually it was just like, oh man, like you should add some rhythm to it. You know, it was like, it, it, you know, it was just yeah, like in, it just kind of got embedded into your, your ear, you know, after, after playing it, um, so many times, I guess, but. Um, it just takes a lot of practice, really. Um, but I mean, look, I mean when I when did it when did it dawn on you that that you know when you turned the paper over um, and you just started to play by feel uh, that you never played the same song the same way once. Um. Well, I guess you know what like, I mean by you know what I mean by that. Like where it it, it you know sort of the aesthetic of the. It's that that improvisational aesthetic and jazz are, you know, out of the Grateful Dead canon where, you know, Phil Lesh said, he goes, we never played the same song the same way once. Right, right. When did, Um, I mean, because that was, see, to to me, like, that's the magic of, like, like, you can play My Funny Valentine or you can play, like, you know, some kind of, like, kind of hokey, essentially hokey tune, but once you leave the head of the tune based on the trust you have with the other players, I mean, it's going to, you could take it way out and, and bring it back, but ultimately it's about never playing it the same way. And that to me is, that's music. I, I, I think classical yeah. music is great. I think it's obviously accepted because it's, uh, I mean, if you really look at everything that's going on in our country right now, I mean, what's most accepted is classical music and it's from Europe. Uh, blues is is a black art form, but now you have blues festivals and there's not one black outfit on the on the bill. Jazz has never been really accepted in the country that it was made in. It's it's consumed in Europe and in Japan. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I just never get off on your uh, classical music because you're just taking a cues from a conductor, you know. And the magic of con- yeah. conversational music is never playing the same song the same way once. And I, I just want you to riff on that concept and how you fit it into Pacific Range or anything else. Yeah, and that's I think that's the beauty of improvisation, you know, um, doing something different, even though, I mean, it's, it's about like the journey, you know, um, throughout the song. And, um, and I mean, also just keeping, keeping, your, keeping it new for yourself. Um, you know, but you you mentioned like Charlie Parker and, you know, he was, um, he's amazing, you know, uh, he, he, his improvisational skills, you know, where, I mean, I listen to him all the time, you know, it's like he's flying over <laughs> everything, you know, it's really amazing. 
Um, but uh, I guess, I mean, being able to play something not the same, you know, it keeps it fresh and, um, and, and, it, and it pushes everybody else to listen and um, kind of go to places where, um, you know, maybe they wouldn't usually go. And I think that that creates a really great spontaneity um, in, in music. And that's something that the Grateful Dead really did show uh, show me um, when I was when I was like in uh, middle school is when I started kind of getting into them. Even though my my parents, you know, they kind of brought me up with it. Um, I, I kind of went back and because I had a bunch of tapes and stuff. Um, got, <laughs> yeah, got right. like a cassette, got a cassette player and started listening to all those uh, recordings, those audience recordings that they that they did. Um, and uh, it was just like, wow, this is this is like opened my it opened my mind to like what you know a band could really do because here here you have like this this band that's um got um a ton of songs um and some of them are just like you know they're they're staples but um it's never it's always it's always different and um i think that that's yeah, there's, that's that's the beauty of it all. Yeah, I, I totally did. I know. First of all, I mean, I, I interviewed Ross James uh, three days ago, and he was like, basically, he he said something. I haven't actually heard it vocalized, but he said, you know, the Dead Canon songbook is an extension of the American songbook. Really, I mean, it's it's yeah. I can't. I mean, how many times you go to a bar and you hear a band break out a Dead tune? I I mean, again, the your parents were super hip. I mean, most people. Um, you know, and, and this has been, I never saw the dead, you know, I'm 42. I, I got into them, uh, after post Jerry, uh, in terms of, and I, and I got off on, um, the live, uh, analog cassettes, uh, especially from the early eighties, very desperate, urgent time. Uh, most people think that's a very bad time for the band, but the music was explosive and they fell off the tracks and got back on. And it just was like, just this roaring and it never was the same, but I think a lot of people, yeah. even older than me, um, you know, it was always like they had this huge fan base. But then there was also it was like very visceral, like either you loved them or you hated them. And I think that the hating the reason that people didn't get out, off on them is because growing up in Indiana or Missouri and you're going to a bar and you're putting in skeletons from the closet. If that's what you think the Grateful Dead is, you know, that's that's not who they were. And if that's all you're listening to is Studio Dead, you're not going to get it, yeah. you know. And, and and it was the live component of it, um, and and that's and to me, there I, I I wonder if that's something that you try not not you're not copying them, but that essence of of going in without a set list with Pacific Range or. Going in, how how free do you guys at this point approach the presentation of your music? I, there's nothing I can stand. Le- I can't handle formula trips, so yeah. I'm just wondering about you know, um, you know how where you how you guys like to approach a, a live a live per live performance. Yeah, I mean we we get up there and uh, you know um, I mean. We do have a set list sometimes, um, just because it's a, it'd be, it's a, it would be kind of serves as like a nice road map. You know, we change it up, you know, every time we play. Um, but uh, it's, but yeah, going going back to like I guess what Ross Ross James said about you know it being like an American songbook. You know, it's kind of like a tip of the hat. You know, to, yeah, big time. To, to what the Dead did. You know, they're a huge influence on on what I, you know, play and listen to. And, um, and, uh, yeah, they are, they are kind of like an American, you know, uh, traditional band at this point, I think. Um, they're, they're, who would have ever thought they were a trad band, not in the music sense, but I mean, in the, in the lexicon of the, of the, of the, uh, and I mean, that speaks to, I mean, my second book came out about, the Merry Pranksters, Wavy Gravy, uh, the Grateful yeah. Dead Poets, and all the Grateful Dead side projects that all the members of those side projects, and it's a pretty heavy book, and I mean, Barlow mm-hmm. and I did a couple of interviews, and 
you know, he had his own Wyoming rugged, you know, sort of, you know, frontiersman lyricism with Weir. And then Hunter was mm-hmm. off in this other sort of, you know, bastion of psychedelia and, but also, uh, yeah. he, you know, I mean, th- like, those guys were freaking insane. But the funny thing is, like, I, you know, because I've interviewed Justin Kreutzman a few times, and he he told me that, um, like, when Hunter would write a song, um, if he played Jerry the chord changes that Hunt, that he had wrote to the song, Jerry couldn't get them out of his head for weeks. <laughs> so after a yeah. while, he was like, Hunter, just just give me the song. I don't want to hear the chord change. I got to make my own chord changes. You know, like yeah. it's it just it, it to me. It was like, but it was you know. I mean, is is there? Do you think, in some ways, um, is there? What is in your mind? How can you extend that lexicon? I mean, it's it's not an easy question, but where do you see it? How can you continue to build that bridge that they built from the the, the Rodgers and Hammerstein or the, you know, yeah. the, the classic Americans, where, where, how can the, how can you guys take it further? Well, I think when it comes to like lyrics and things like that, you really have to be uh, speaking uh, from the heart. Um, and, uh, and you have to be, I mean, Robert Hunter was like an extremely well-read person, yes. I think. And um, he, uh, he just, he, had a very profound uh, knowledge of, you know, uh, like art and, and like, I think like Shakespearean kind of, you know, literature and and, and things like that, you know? Um, So I think that being well-read and also, um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, write something that comes from uh, the heart, but uh, as more of like a collective uh, kind of, kind of oneness, um, I, cause I, I think that that's a super, um, important, um, aspect that the, that the dead, um, were able to, uh, kind of put, put forward for, for their fans and stuff. Um, it's, uh, well, I mean, it, it I mean, it, it, the, the, the resonance carries over to multi-generational through and through. So there's obviously, yeah. I mean, the idea of like a, a song like Dire Wolf, you know, that's mm-hmm. a song, that's a card game um, about uh, there's some dubiousness, but it's also mixed with nature and animal and people. I mean, it's just so, that's just one oh. example. It's just so like the imagery is out of hand. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, yeah. it, it, do, do you find that, um, I mean, where do you need to grow the most in terms of, do you do, do do you do a lot of songwriting? And if so, what, where what's the area that you were trying to hone in on in this time of um, this extended pause? Um, yeah, uh, I've been I've been doing some songwriting, and you know all the all the lyrics on the album, uh, uh, I, I wrote those, and um, it's uh, you know you you find a lot of inspiration, yeah, and just. I find a lot of inspiration personally in nature, um, and uh, there, people are always going to be in nature as much as you know. Um, our, a lot of people's perceptions don't allow them to see it that way. I don't think. Why? Why not? Um, um, I think it's. Uh, I think it's because. Um, I mean, I don't want to just like blame everything on like our society. No, no. I'm just right? no. I want your opinion. Yeah, I mean, just just riff. There's no right or wrong answer. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that we are kind of a part of like this kind of social. There, there is a social construct where people are kind of they have to be held to a certain standard in order to kind of, uh, or what they think will, oh, gosh, um, make them, I guess, um, successful or whatever. I, I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know. Uh, I guess I don't know the the it's it's tough for people to separate or to keep they're just not like quite as in touch with um, like their uh, their na- like the their natural kind of surroundings because I mean we're all humans you know we're all on this earth and um, we're we're really um, just like one 
big organism, you know, uh, just uh, really trying to thrive and um, do what we can to, to survive. And um, there, I think that there's just like a lot of um, a lot of people that don't really have that uh, that perception um, where it's you know the individual and um, there there's just like kind of uh, like a break in the in the in the chain. Dude, you're a hundred percent. I mean, that's a very wise, astute point. I mean, part of it is also as an artist, um, I mean, and I chronicle this with guys that played in Hunter's side bands, but he was a recluse beyond belief. I mean, that guy's idea of show business was, you know, being a hermit. He didn't want, like, it was like, I, I mean, this idea of, of climbing the, the ladder of success and having to almost sell out in order to, um, be successful by the standards that society says you should be successful is that's the hook. That's where the break came in as opposed to just finding the organic path towards living off the land, taking care of your family and creating and writing and doing art. Yeah. And whatever it takes to do that, like living within your means, you right, know, exactly. and, and not, and not, uh, you know, being uh, distracted by, um, I guess, all of the uh all of the luxuries of you know of whatever like fame will bring people or, or things like that you know fame um, fame that's the killer yeah i mean that's one reason yeah. i i mean even going back to the chico state days is were you guys always sort of hip to the idea of um uh, taking the insecure route so to speak and and not buying into the rule living life by the rules that that you wanted to live by. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it was definitely, um, yeah, the, my, from going up to Chico State and, and being back down here again in and, and, and SoCal, it's, um, it's definitely like, uh, it, it was an eye-opening experience because it really, um, I mean, everybody's got such a, um, I don't know, it really opened my eyes just being up there you know, the, the capabilities of, of people, um, being able to just, you know, love each other. Um, and really that's what's, uh, I think the solution to a lot of what's, what's happening, um, nowadays. Um, yeah, especially when you have leaders that are just trying to rip people apart, you know, that's the issue. Yeah. 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 It's brutal. You know, it's you brutal. just have like a lot of the, these tyrants, you know, in, in multiple countries, you know, Absolutely, it's 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 a reflection of the of the mountains of madness in the world at this time, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, being up in Chico, it really did open my eyes to like what the capabilities of, um, you know, like uh, like what what humans are uh, able to do. You know? <laughs> well, maybe what humans are meant to do, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and being up there, I mean, it was. It was really easy. I felt like to kind of, you know, like like, you know, completely tied down by the the stresses that um, you know people maybe here like in Los Angeles, um, you know, feel. Um, I mean, I'm glad that I'm I'm here now and I can I could feel that stress, you know, um, just because it's it's a it's a more populated area. You know, a lot of a lot of people here yeah it's also people are like it's it's a total rat race i mean you know it's like uh, yeah i mean within those pockets of authenticity there's also just people that are you know um you know just a direct reflection of of our current civilization and it's manic and it's neurotic and uh even though um yeah and then you look back to a time in the 70s when Seamus Turner very easily could have been, you know, fiddling his way into the studio scene, playing on jingles, commercials. I've interviewed all the cats from the from the studio scene from when it was hopping, and, you know, it was um, a gluttonous time. I mean, in some ways, those guys really effed it up. I mean, it, it, they did. They didn't know they were doing it, but, I mean, you know, Steely Dan had a half a million dollar budget. They could just bring in all these cats and, you know, record companies, you know – 
they could send Joni Mitchell out on a, you know, 10, 15 week tour because, and, yeah. and write it off as a loss because the records themselves were making so much money. And that's the issue today. Yep. And that's what goes back to our original conversation is that wrote, you know, the only way you're making dough as a musician today is by touring, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, right now it's really tough on people because um, there no no one can go out and tour. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's kind of like the tables have turned as far as kind of like what the record industry um, has kind of turned into since what what, what you said like in the seventies and um, you know it's it's kind of like the opposite now. Exactly. I mean, the days of Bob Dylan or Robert Hunter in Recluse writing songs and then selling records and making a, a good buck, it, it's gone. So, Mike, you know, have you, um, you know, I, I talked to Ross, when I talked to Ross, we, Ross was saying, you know, he's pretty prolific about doing um, live streaming concerts on Instagram or Facebook Live, whatever. And um, mm-hmm. he talks about being able to feel that magic that you talked about, um, uh, early on in this interview about feeding off the energy. You know, it's different. I mean, you're not you're not locking eyeballs with people. You're not, you know, right. playing off how people are dancing or letting the body dance. And it's it's a you know you're looking into a computer. But he still said that's the, that's how powerful rhythm and vibration and music is. Is that he can still feel it? Have you? I mean, some people are are like, it's not for me, man. It's not authentic. Where do you have you done? Any, I know you played with 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 uh, with Brent, Brent Rad. You guys played yesterday or something like that. But I mean, yeah. in terms of your own self, like how often are you zooming out? Uh, you know, it's um, it, it, that's a, it's a tough one. You know, because I uh, I love just. I mean, I always think that just like you know, <laughs> face to face person, you know, uh, contact is with with any kind of given situation is is the way to go. Right. Uh, you know, um, streaming, um, I, I, I do have some mixed feelings about it, but it's, um, right now I know that there are people out there that need something to look forward to and, um, being able to provide that, um, is, is something that's just really, it really is beautiful, you know, uh, in itself to go ahead and, um, and, and play some tunes for people because they, they're, they're deprived of it, you know? And, um, I mean, we've, it makes us feel good too when we're together and we're, and we're playing, um, and we're playing, uh, these, these streaming, these streaming, uh, sites and things. Um, you know, we've got a couple that are going to be coming up, um, which we're, we're pretty excited about. And can you talk um, about when are they going to be? Uh, I believe there's going to be one on the 17th and then there's another one i think on the 24th i gotta get those those dates a little more locked down but um the one on the 24th is going to be um it's going to be uh real time and um we're going to get uh we're going to get jamming um the location as far as where we're going to be doing it we're still kind of up in the air but we're we're going to figure it out do it on somebody's front porch uh, streaming curbside shows um but yeah, well, I look. Uh, I mean, this is uh, you know, um, I got an, I got another name that voice uh, for Seamus Turner, and then and we'll come back. All right. He had like something that used to really make me feel good about in playing music was like knowing that that we're all feeling it at the same that like like oh wow he's he's so into it too. You know, like that, that... I, you know, I mean, that, that, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, yeah. what, like, like, let me ask you, though, like, like, this is really interesting. What, when Farmer Dave came over, what, what did you learn and relax about as it related to the songwriting process? Because uh, you clearly collaborated and began to become a songwriter. So how, how did, how does that process work for Chris Gunst? The process of writing music, you mean? Or, or yeah. Like, or just yeah, write, you know, writing, how, writing a song I, as opposed to just sort of transition. Yeah. As opposed to just yeah. getting in a room and, and, and feel and playing, you know, but, but actually crafting yeah, yeah, something. Like, yeah. Hey, how about this little part? Right. And then, yeah. And then, so I think, 
you know, I just start getting more used to the structures and stuff like that. And then, and then, um, you know, back then, I would probably, you know, hear hear a song or or hear a vibe from from a particular record or something like that or other music and and just be like, wow, like there's something in me in that, you know. And then like, how what what is my what is my kind of version of that, you know, or or something like that. And then I'd fiddle around and see what what came up and if it brought up the same feeling maybe I'd try and flesh it out a little bit more but I think what I learned from like Brent and and Dave because they were kind of confident with these songs like hey here's the song I wrote and it was finished was just like um you know the the path or the um you know the permission to do it you know like well what would it be like if I tried that you know, like maybe I'll try that. Right, and, and right. Put it out there. You know. Well, I mentioned his voice. Uh, have you have you had a chance to play with Chris Gunst at all? Um, no, I, I haven't played with Chris Gunst. Uh, I've met him a few times though, and um, he's uh, I think he's I think he's like Clay's like second cousin. Dude, the, I mean the family the, the that family is legendary. I've been chronicling that family for a long time, and. Um, yeah. But I do want you to talk a little bit. I mean, all those guys. Uh, I mean, he was talking about, I mean, he didn't even know. He was just playing free and jamming, kind of like you. And then all of a sudden, he ran into guys like B-Rad and Farmer. And, yeah. And here are these yeah. guys coming over with, like, songs, like, built songs. And, like, and all of a sudden, they're like, well, why don't you add something to, to the gumbo? And it was, like, invigorating. He's like, I didn't know this is how it worked. And uh, uh-huh. I just would love you to talk a little bit. I mean, those guys are the elder statesmen in my mind of the, uh, uh, you know, it, from what I've chronicled of this sort of milieu and SoCal, so to speak. Uh, and mm-hmm. I just want you to talk about, you know, what you, the leadership that guys like Rademacher, you know, how did you fall in with, with, yeah. with those cats? And, and what, what, are they, what have they meant to your, to your career and, and to your, you know, constitution as a musician? Well, um, yeah, all all those guys, uh, you know, they um, they contribute to the music um, just as much as uh, just as much as I do, and um, you know, we uh, you know bring a song uh, to to the practice, or um, and then uh, pretty much um, you know everybody kind of adds their their own flavor to it, their suggestions, um, and. Uh, you know, we try to, uh, and then we then we just kind of um, ha- we we play it, and um, whatever we think or feels uh, uh, sounds good um, is kind of how it is. It, it's it's a pretty natural process, I feel, and it it comes out uh, pretty organically because everybody, no one's really telling each other uh, what to do. Um, only maybe just like a couple suggestions, you know, here and there. And um, and then it it, it's a, it turns into a pretty cohesive thing when there's not like a ton of pressure to have it sound like a certain way or anything like that, you know. Um, how so. did how did you meander down from? I mean, did you grow up in in, a, in the LA area, or how did you wind up going? I mean, it, did you just head down there after college, or how did you get connected in there? Good, and then we uh, and then. I, we lived in Glendale. I, I lived in Glendale for like the first like 10 years of my life. And then after that, we moved up to Port Rainimi, which is in Ventura, or like Oxnard area. Um, oh, yeah, that's where the great... Do yeah. you know who lives there? I, you may not be hip to this. You know the Vince Guaraldi record, uh, Cast Your Fate to the Wind? I, I know Vince Guaraldi. Yeah, yeah. Vince, so, yeah. so this is great. It's just beautiful because I just started transcribing my interview. I'll send you the interview, but... Uh, Port Wayne, however you pronounce that. Uh, the drummer, the, the, he did a Giraldi's first major album was Black Orpheus, and they did a they did a a song, a, a one tune on there, "Cast Your Fate to the Wind," and the drummer was Colin Bailey, and he lives there. And I do, I went to visit him last year and did a Facebook Live interview with him. He's like, this is a dude who was on the bandstand in '41. They didn't even know what a bass was, two accordions, drums, and banjo. How badass is that? That is, that so is bad at yeah. he's like we didn't even know what a bass was man <laughs> i freaking love yeah, it yeah. anyway port wayne yeah. or whatever yeah i was up there man so so you were yeah, you, yeah. 
beach town, you know. Yeah. And um, that, those are a great few years, you know, living there growing up. Because, I mean, like, we, I mean, moving from, like, Glendale, which is kind of more inland, you know. You, you got to take, like, an hour, hour and a half to get to the beach sometimes, you know, um, from where that is. And then to go in to live, like, a couple blocks away, you know, was really, it's really quite a quite a privilege growing up you know um but after that we moved up to newberry park which is more um like in the mountains off the 101 there and um uh and that's where i went to like high school and stuff but i mean i've always been kind of like i've been kind of all over southern california and back down and i've been living back down in los angeles like the past three or four years and um it's, it's been all right. It's definitely been a hustle, but, you know, um, that's kind of how I met uh, Cameron and Stu because uh, they went to La Cunata High School along with Sam and Clay, um, except Sam and Clay are, like, a couple years younger than them. Um, so uh, they they all kind of, like, went to school together, um, and um, one night uh, we we're, were playing as uh, – <laughs> we, we, we called ourselves Salty Spittoons, well, wait, 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 I'm sorry. What was it? The Salty Spittoons. It's kind of like our first, like, when we first moved down here, it's kind of the name of our band. And we're first trying to get it going. That's <laughs> so and, classic. Yeah, it was. It, it's like a SpongeBob reference, you know. Oh, my God, I <laughs> love it, dude. That's so your generation. Go ahead. <laughs> but, yeah, we, we played, and then um, – our, our bud, uh, uh, who, who we still hang out with um, pretty regularly, uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Meisenheimer. Um, he, uh, he was kind of on the outs uh, as far as being a bass player, and then Cameron showed up to a gig we were playing, and uh, we were like, oh, Cam, you know, you want to come and jam with us? And he's just like, yeah. And then we all moved down, and um, eventually, uh, and, and Stu and Cameron go way back. They've been jammed. Hey there, I think I lost you there. For no, a the spirits, you're, you're going deep into the bag. The spirits just cut us off for a minute. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. Um, so, Cam, yeah, Cam showed up uh, to one of our gigs, and uh, and him and Stu go uh, pretty far back um, uh, playing music together pretty much since they're, I think, like in elementary school. And so they have a pretty uh, unique bond of just growing up together. And um, uh, it all just kind of, it all just kind of happened, you know, um, to where uh, we got together. We started playing a bunch of gigs and um, all around it was just, you know, it was all about just having fun, you know, and it's still that way too. And uh, now we're a part of like a really uh, sick label, you know, um, which is, you know, uh, Run by, run by B Rad there. Oh, dude, legend, dude. What is that? What is what is Brent Rademacher meant to the to the Southern California music scene? Yeah, I mean everything that he's done from like uh, Beachwood Sparks or from like further Beachwood Sparks, you know, Gospel Beach. Um, I mean he's he's got his hand in a lot of uh, different uh, pots, and he has like a really excellent um, selection of musicians that he surrounds himself with. So. I mean, he's he's just like an OG dude um, who has a ton of experience um, in in the LA music scene, and uh, we're really uh, stoked to be a part of that. You know, um, I first I first met him uh, maybe like had to been had to been like five years ago because I was still in, in school and I was coming down and visiting and Mapache was playing, and um, I did like a little acoustic set. It was for the because Brent was putting on like this um, lonesome LA cowboy night. Um, where was it? Where was, the, where was it the, the Lost Night or what, uh, some some speakeasy? Yeah, where, or, yeah, uh, the Lost Night, not the Griffin. Yeah, the, the Lost Night. Oh, that's an, insane. And uh, yeah, we that's that's the first time I really met him, and um, we uh, uh, and, and then you just kind of kept tabs on on what. Uh, we were doing as a band after that, you know. Yeah, no, he know um, he knows that he knows an authentic group when he when he hear when he know when he hears it, you know. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's it's pretty badass. I mean, Seamus, I mean, I can we do part two? I mean, I I just feel like we're just starting to cook a little bit. I I got another interview up right now, but I'd love to have you back on sure. the program. Oh, absolutely, yeah, um, yeah. Whenever you have time, just uh, 
you know, give me a holler and, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to keep talking with you, you know? Uh, I mean, um, I just want you to, you know, make sure you, 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 you give, send some texts out to, to Mapache and B Red today. Let them know that you were cooking with Jake Fine. But I just, I'm looking to bring some. I want to keep yeah. the I want to keep the frequencies high, man. Because uh, you know, ultimately, um, this is the only thing I know how to do to stay on the righteous path. And and I appreciate you going there with me today, man. Oh hey, you know Jake, I, I follow what you do. And, uh, <laughs> you dig it, it, it man. It's, it's really cool, man. Like you you keep it super real and and uh, you know these. These are these are good. I, I really do like your your conversation and your questions that you ask too. They're they're in depth, which um, is uh, you know sometimes in interviews it it, it kind of goes the other way. You know? uh, dude, I mean so, it's uh, it's nice to be. Uh, yeah, I think part of that issue comes in because if people are getting a paycheck from an organ, a, co- a corporation or institution, I mean they're really their their lack of creative control is paramount and for me just being be able to have to do this i mean the my elders helped me find my voice and now i get a chance to still continue that but also connect with my generation and and younger cats to uh continue uh the lineage uh, so that future generations like my daughters know how real music is made so um yeah man keep keep swinging and uh and we'll do part two real soon Right on. Sounds good, Jake. Be cool, man. Be safe. Be cool, man. Yeah, much love. Yeah. Yeah, much love to you. Yeah, man. Be good. All right. Peace. I'll see you. Yeah, man. Peace.